So Sidir, so there are different kinds of selection. What are the different kinds of selection? Can you help us understand what they are? So selection basically comes in three varieties. The one is no selection at all. So it's called neutrality. It's called neutrality. And in this case, one might have a, a DNA mutation that actually has no effect on function because its effect is masked by property of the DNA. For example, what we call a synonymous mutation, which only changes the DNA, but not the protein that goes with so it. So the body stays identical. Yes, so for body's perspective, it's identical, and therefore a vast majority of synonymous mutations are actually completely neutral. Mm -hmm. But then there are mutations that actually change the amino acid. And if this mutation that changes the amino acid... So amino acids are what make up proteins. Yes. So essentially a mutation changes the genetic code, which then changes the protein. And then change in protein often has a negative impact because protein can no longer function as... And usually for most mutations, right? So that's... Of all what, what is, what's the ratio of things that do something good versus do something bad? Well, there are a number of ways to estimate the ratio, but it's like 10 to 1. You can think if you look at, at least, synonymous, say, yeah. yeah, synonymous and non-synonymous mutations, uh, we will see that mutations that actually change the protein, which is the non-synonymous mutation, in fact, is one tenth the frequency in the observed world than and, the and, synonymous. And of mutation. the non-synonymous mutations that actually do something to change protein, what percentage of those benefit the organism, and what percentage of those harm the organism? So generally, it's considered that. A small percentage. Now, nobody actually have an estimate of what that number is, but that could be as low as one percent, or could be as high as, as high as five percent. Uh, so, when you look at people and their differences, mm -hmm. most of the differences are mutations that actually have no effect. And in fact, those are the mutations that are found in many many people, mm -hmm. which is what we call high frequency. A lot of people have them; they don't have any negative impact that we can perceive, and they are more or less neutral. So there's a lot of things that are kind of neutral, but they might have interesting effects. For instance, for some people, tasting broccoli is a very strong taste that they don't like very much. For other people, tasting broccoli, they don't care much about it. That might well influence whether they eat broccoli or not, and whether or not, or not they get the beneficial chemicals of broccoli. You want to talk about these complex ways that genes influence so, bodies? So yeah, so many mutations can have an effect on some phenotype. Uh, but what, what, what's a phenotype? So phenotype is basically a trait. Uh, so what, what your body's like. Yeah, so basically, you know, broccoli aversion is a phenotype. Right. Or the taste, uh, tasting things, uh, bitter versus not tasting bitter is a phenotype. How the eye color is a phenotype. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, not all the phenotype changes or all the trait changes actually have a negative impact. Even though I may not like broccoli, I could get a similar kind of uh, uh, nutrients from another vegetable. So mm -hmm. ultimately, we substitute all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if broccoli was the only uh, you know, vegetable available in the whole world, it would definitely have an effect. Right. And that explains that neutrality or no effect is conditional upon the environment. If the environment changes, it will actually have a detrimental effect. So there is no such thing as truly neutral or truly adaptive variant. It depends on the context whether it is external or internal. I'd never thought about it before, but our broccoli now is a lot milder tasting than the broccoli of years and years ago before they started breeding it. And that might change how genotypes interact with eating the stuff and health. Yes, no, absolutely. Oh, interesting. So, so we, we are, as humans, changing our environment. And what so is there such a thing as a good gene or a bad gene separate from an environment? No, there is, I mean, it is easier to work with genes by themselves because environment is a hard, uh, you know, context to emulate or study, right. uh, and we can only observe things in different environments, like you know, high altitude, lack, lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. There are a few places like that which are easier to see, mm -hmm. but in general, environment is very important to go with with genes. But right now, we are trying to study as much we can study about genes in general, right. and then hopefully, gene environment interaction can become clearer as we know what are important genes and what kind of environments they're important in. So in, a, in an environment, um, a gene can either make individuals who have more children than usual, fewer children than usual, or the same number. 
So can you just summarize as we wrap up this part, uh, those different kinds of selection again? Yeah, so if a mutation makes you have more children because either you get wealth or you are a good athlete or for some other reason, you have better looks or bluer eyes, then in that case, you will have what we call positive selection because you have produced more than expected. Right. And if you produce fewer than expected because of whatever defect in the DNA causes problems for one to have children or be desirable to have children with, then that would be negative selection. Right. And then the one that when there is no net change in uh, phenotype or trait or ultimately reproductive success would be called neutral mutation. And we're going to go on in just a moment and talk about your new methods for using that neutrality to do some very interesting things. Mm -hmm.